Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are in the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at chapter 19, and today we're looking at verses 41 through 48. Jesus, at this point, has come into Jerusalem for the Passover feast, and um, it's going to cover the last days uh, and teaching during those days of his life. So let's pray, and we'll get into the Word today. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and for your kindness. We thank you for revealing who you are to us through your spirit. You are perfect. You are holy. You are faithful. You are good. You are light. Your mercy endures forever. Your love is is without end. Your forgiveness so deep and rich, hard to fathom. So as we go into your word today, Lord, please, in your mercy and goodness, once again, open our minds supernaturally to understand and to realize your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting with verse 41. As Jesus approached and saw the city, this is Jerusalem, he wept for it saying, if you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground. And they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. He went into the temple and began to throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people were looking for a way to kill him, but they could not find a way to do it because all the people were captivated by what they heard. Last time we were together, we talked about as Jesus come, went into the city, he gave instructions to his disciples. They followed through on those destruction, instructions And those instructions themselves were a manifestation of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. They were experienced, made manifest to his disciples through obedience. Today we see another gift at play, and that is the gift of prophecy. I like to once again go to 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to um, look at verses 7 and 8, and, and, or 8, 9, and 10, rather, as we look at um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why it's important to understand these is once we begin to understand the spiritual gifts, see, Jesus says something very profound in his ministry in various ways, but it's still just as profound in each way that he that he articulates it. In one way, he says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will be able to say to that tree, go throw yourself into the ocean or mountain, whatever, and it will. He says in the Gospel of John, if anyone has faith in me, he will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Later on, he talks about the Holy Spirit and he says of the Holy Spirit that he will bring glory to me. These are Jesus' words. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine 
and make it known to you. And through the Holy Spirit, we receive grace, the charis, and we receive from that grace individual gifts, specific gifts of grace that the scripture calls charisma. And when we exercise those gifts or practice them, if you will, put them into practice, then we are charismatic. We're practicing those gifts. Jesus embodied all of them. So when we take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as it relates to what we just read regarding Jesus' prophecy over Jerusalem, he says this in verse 8. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit or I prefer the translation, a word of wisdom. To another, a word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, I'm sorry. Yeah, to another, gifts of healings. Gifts is plural, but also healings is plural. So it should be gifts of healings by the one spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. Now, prophecy is a gift. Um, it's also a calling. So in the body of Christ, some people may be given gifts from the Spirit. And one of those gifts may be a prophetic gift, meaning from time to time they are able to speak prophetically into a situation. At other times, people are called to a vocation of prophet. In the Old Testament, we have those Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Malachi, the list goes on. Those were people that were called to a for a specific time as a vocation of being a prophet. Jesus, many times when we think of him, we understand him as being the Messiah, as being the Son of God. But oftentimes, we don't think of him as frequently being the greatest prophet. He speaks prophetically, and like most prophets, almost every prophet, they speak with regards to the concern and the consequences and the direction of the holy city of Jerusalem, where God chose to place his temple. So this is a prophetic utterance. Now, prophecy and miracles often go hand in hand. Not all the time, but many times they do. Because miracles validate the authority of the prophet. You see this happen with Isaiah. You, or, I'm sorry, you see this happen with Elijah. You see it happen with Elisha. And so the miracles that Jesus performed validated his vocation as prophet. And God's concern has always been Jerusalem because it is where he has placed his name. Even before the Jer Jerusalem was founded, even before the temple was built, God prophesied that the Israelites were to go to the place where God would place his name. And it was there that they would go up three times a year to give sacrifices and celebrate the feasts, the three different feasts. So Jerusalem was core. And Jerusalem, having the temple of God, symbolized to the nation their history, their purpose, their identity, their everything about them was embodied 
in Jerusalem because the temple was there. Now, this is why if you go to Jerusalem today, Jews will come to the Western Wall. The Western Wall is a wall that is still there today that was a retaining wall that re- as a retaining wall was used to maintain the land on which the temple was built. Now, days, Jews will go to the temple or to the Western Wall, sometimes called the Whaley Wall, to worship. But they're not allowed, well, they are allowed on the temple mount, but they're not allowed to go into the Dome of the Rock or to the mosque that's on there. But God had this special place, this special heart for Jerusalem. And throughout all of Jerusalem's history, he prophesied concerning it. Even to the point now where you go to Jerusalem, to the Revel- book of Revelation, where John prophesied saying that in the future for the resurrection, there is a new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new Jerusalem. And so Jesus comes in and says, this is what's going to happen because you didn't accept God's return as God returned through Christ. And what Jesus prophesied in these verses actually took place in 70 AD. The Romans got fed up with the rebellion that was taking place in Jerusalem. They surrounded Jerusalem. And in an uncontrolled rage and violent outburst, they tore down the, te- the, the walls. They tore down the buildings, the temple. They killed everybody there. It was a complete, utter raising of that city. And Jesus being the prophet, prophesied that that would happen. It's important for us to understand that because Jesus gives prophecy regarding his return. And many times the prophecy of his return is intermixed with his prophecy regarding Jerusalem. In this case, it is not. But his return is just as certain And the prophecies that he's given speaking directly and also through the spirit, through the through the apostle John are just as certain to happen as well. And it's important to pay heed to that. Because it is supernatural knowledge that God gives us through the prophetic word. When he goes into the temple, the zeal for his The love of his father's temple was so much that he could not take the fact that people had turned it into a marketplace under a religious banner. And as such, the focus was more on the money and the religiosity concerning the money than it was the actual worship of the Lord. And in a zeal for God's temple, for his father's house, He tips over. He doesn't hurt anybody, but he ransacks the various places and turns them over as an expression of cleansing. God's anger is never to punish. It's always to cleanse. God's anger is never to hurt arbitrarily. The devil wants to hurt with the intention of hurt. God's punishment, if you will, is always for the purpose of cleansing. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Next time we get together, we will take a look at verse 20, where he's teaching and is confronted. Until then, may the peace of God be with you. And may you understand that his love for you and the gifts that he has for you in through his spirit and his presence will never leave you. They're irrevocable. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.